This is myth two. So this is the second of our Saturdays in a series of 12. And this series of 12, if we're able to deliver this in the right way, this series of 12 will achieve a kind of a curving, an arc. So instead of a linear series of 12, there should be a kind of trajectory of a rising of intuition and a coming together expectantly of something to follow. And instead of a line, we will have an arch, an arc. And if I'm precise enough, the arc will be one quarter of a circle. So that if the same procedure happens four times, we will have a circle, we will have circumambulated an area and have established a cycle. Hopefully this is the cycle of integration. Integration is a cycle and its cycle could be characterized as completion. So that integrate, like integration likes to complete, likes to finish up, likes to get there, get it all tied up. This dynamic tendency to get everything finished makes of integration a paired possibility on a very broad and yet very deep level. Integration can happen or not happen. If it happens, the coming together, the tying it up becomes like a bow. And if it doesn't happen, the integration becomes like a knot. So you can end up with a knot or a bow. So integration has a precarious quality to it as well as a promising quality. So promise and precarious go together in the integral cycle. Now there's a second cycle we don't have to concern ourselves with here, but the education has a second year because there's a whole other cycle. There's a whole different circle. And the circle of differentiation is a, an opening up of the bow and consciousness characterizes the differential cycle, whereas nature characterizes the integration cycle. Now, if we have tied a knot in integration, then consciousness will tug at that knot and make it worse. If we have tied a bow, consciousness will pull the bow and we'll get the present. So everything founds itself on a precedent, it's rather like a legal situation. And in a way, the ancient, ancient understanding of divine law or divine plan was based on this conception that one needs to follow along in a precedent setting way to make the situation happen as the case the only difficulty being that we live in a time when human beings have opened up to an enormous extent and instead of the case being some kind of tribal level or some kind of regional level or even a national level, the case now, as Ludwig Wittgenstein said, the world is everything that is the case the entirety of the world. And so we as living beings have a task that is almost too formidable for us. We have to integrate an entire world and then we have to differentiate that entire world in order to live in it. And this has become improbable, if not impossible, because the educational models given to us no longer work. They never did work very well, but they used to work well enough to allow us to 
the Midwestern American word was fudge. To fudge, to crib a little bit, to get through. But the difficulty now is that with the third millennium, because we're not just entering the 21st century, we're entering the third millennium. And this third millennium is completely different from the one that we have just left, have already exited. Integration, because of its natural basis, always has a time form constraint. Time is always a part of an integration mode. So that the cycle of integration was always understood, even 50, 100, 200,000 years ago, men and women understood that the progression of the seasons, making the annual year, was a kind of a time which applied to bringing things together. That the seasonal timing of the annual year was the time binding to all of the forms that would work in integration. And so to know where one is integrally includes in all cases time, a time factor. Not a clock time yet, nor a digital time yet. At the very beginning was a seasonal time. And the seasons originally were not in a quaternary, but they were in a triad. The original annual year in very ancient times, we call those ancient times old stone age. The word for it is paleolithic, lithic stone, paleo old. In paleolithic times, the seasons were only three. There was a winter, there was a spring, and there was summer autumn. In summer, autumn, it was a gathering time. Winter was a laying fallow. Spring was a get out and go. The hunter-gatherer societies that men and women belonged to in the old Stone Age in Paleolithic times had a very definite quality and characteristic. The wise man the wise masculine in the Paleolithic was always a shaman. But in the Neolithic, the wise man was a shepherd, not a shaman. And we have to understand that kind of transition because now when we look at mythology, the arrival of mythology signals the Neolithic. In the Paleolithic, what was important was to get the rituals right. In the Neolithic, it's not enough to get the rituals right. You have to get the myths right also. I remember once seeing a sacred bundle, a Natoas, which was unwrapped for me by a very wise old woman to whom it had come in a spiritual lineage. And the central ritual implement in this Natoas was a rattle. And the rattle, the ball of the rattle, was made of the scrotum of a buffalo, of a bull buffalo. And the testes were what rattled in this dried out test, uh, scrotum. And the shaking of this rattle had a very peculiar quality of presence to it. It was akin in some ways to the tail of a rattlesnake. It signaled danger, it signaled peril. And at the same time, it had a tremendous eerie, I have to use a James Joyson phrase here, it had a weird friendly recognition to it, that there was something masculine eternally about this. And being a male, I felt that kind of promise of completing power as well as the peril. So there was the promise and the peril at the same time in the rattle. Now this rattle was nestled into a hat, a headpiece, 
and the headpiece was the crane, cranium of a male buffalo, complete with the horns which had blackened in time. But the hair, the matted, thick, tough hair of the buffalo cranium was still red, still gritty, still had a, a deep kind of an odor to it. And so that buffalo headdress with its horn and this scrotum rattle were the old, ancient, paleolithic instruments of a wise man. The man to whom they had belonged was named Tatanga Mani. Tatanga Mani means walking buffalo, who had died at age 97, and had passed it on to his spirit daughter, and she was the one showing me it. She was in her 80s, and she was nearing death, had had her death dream already, and uh, wanted, because I was her spirit son, wanted to know what I wanted to do with this, whether I wanted to inherit it or what to do. She was passing it to me. And I opted to have it buried so that it would never be desecrated. Because anything that is taken out of its natural integral field loses its energy. If you put it into a museum, it loses its energy. If you put it on display in glass, its energy becomes but a picture rather than the presence. Rather than having the Paleolithic presence where it would do some good and it would work in nature as an integral key, it becomes transformed into a pretty picture in a mental context that is completely separated from its actuality. Which is why the tribe, the Blackfoot tribe, does not put on the uh, sun dance anymore. They do not have enough sacred ritual implements to put on the Okan. And new sacred ritual implements can only be made by four shaman bringing their powers together from all four directions at the same time. One, two, or three will not do. Five is too many. It has to be only four. And there were not four. There was only one left alive, Tatangamani. And when he passed, that was it. And with all the other implements in the museums, the National Museum of Canada, the Victoria Museum in BC, museums, the Glenbow Museum in Calgary, it was no longer a chance for the Paleolithic to happen. There was no longer even a chance for the Neolithic to happen. There was only the picture images that did not mean anything integrally to the people that would file past these cases and look at them. There was no presence, there was no reality. And so they would consider the people who used these primitive, somehow these people are out of it. Whereas those people were not out of it at all. Those people made the earth real all through the Paleolithic, which lasted for more than a million years. There was nothing primitive about Paleolithic man. He was wise. But the masculine wisdom in the Paleolithic was about the courage to face the conflict. Always, that was the central quality. The wisdom of the Paleolithic woman, the Earth Mother, was to face the acceptance of the whole of life, including the impossible, including the conflict, including the courageous masculine that got frequently out of control. And so in the Paleolithic, you had a quality of the masculine as the bull and the earth mother as that feminine quality that could not accept the bull and yet had to live with it. That quality of the feminine that had to live with the bull but couldn't accept the bull 
became associated with the moon. And so when the Neolithic dawned about 12,000 years ago, the first sputterings of the Neolithic are in what is today um, Israel. In fact, what is today Palestine again in Jericho. Jericho starts about 10,000 BC, about 12,000 years ago. It's the first time that the sparks of the Neolithic begin to happen. And after 1,000 or 2,000 years, there are other spots on the earth where the Neolithic comes into play. And with the Neolithic, the masculine, instead of being a hunter of animals, is a tamer of animals. And the feminine, instead of being a gatherer of plants, becomes a farming of plants. And the symbol that holds together the Neolithic feminine is the grain goddess who must marry the tamer of animals. And the tamer of animals is that we saw a film about 10 years ago now called The Beastmaster, who had a telepathic connection to an eagle and to a uh, panther and to two little ferrets. Very archetypal. The Neolithic masculine changed from a hunter of animals to a tamer of animals. The shaman transformed to a shepherd. And it was with the shepherd quality of the masculine, the taming of the animals, that the taming of the plants, that a marriage could take place, a hierogamos, a sacred marriage, hierosgamos, a coming together. Now in Greece, that hieros gamos did not, it happened, but it didn't take very well. Zeus marries Hera. Hera is the old earth goddess. Hera is there in Greece a millennium or more. She's indigenous. Before the invaders coming down from the north brought with them their sky god, Zeus, and Hera and Zeus coming together, the marriage of Hera and Zeus, gives some of the attributes of the old Paleolithic masculine to Hera. She becomes known as the ox-eyed goddess, the cow-eyed goddess. In Egypt, she is Hathor. And as the celestial cow, she welcomes the transformative energy of the ritual cycles of the Neolithic, which are no longer based on a three-season year, but a four-season year. Autumn becomes a distinct season. It's as simple as at one time, no one celebrated Halloween, and then all of a sudden, a millennial change happened and everybody started celebrating Halloween that there was an autumnal quality to the annual year that needed special celebration, that needed a complement to spring. And so one puts a Halloween in to complement Easter. One puts a going into the underworld with a kind of elan, not to say childlike joy, ritualized by children putting on horrible masks, that the promise of life inhabits the horrific demons that populate the underworld. It's a Neolithic answer to how do you put two impossible polarities together to make a workable line? How do you put death in the springtime into an integration cycle so that one could accept such a thing. A crucifixion at the very point of life coming back together. So you put a crucifixion and a resurrection together. You put 
children inside of demonic masks, looking for trick or treat, looking for the candy, also being able to trick you. So that this quality of the Neolithic displacing the Paleolithic changed everything. And our education founds itself deep enough to still pay attention to the Paleolithic qualities and values of reality, but centers itself on the Neolithic integration, the four season cycle. And so our 12 weeks of myth that arch and make one quarter of a circle, that arc goes with two previous arcs that we already have made because the education began with nature, 12 weeks of nature. And that linearity of 12 weeks of nature had its arc, and then 12 weeks of ritual, and that made its arc, and now 12 weeks of myth, and that'll make its arc, and then there'll be 12 weeks of symbol, and that'll make its arc, and the cycle will run, nature, ritual, myth, symbol. But as it runs, as we talked about last week, it has a double quality to its power. One part of its power is the collecting of energy. The other part of its power is the dynamic. So the Greek term energeia and the Greek term dynamis both mean power, but they together mean power in an integrated way, a braiding together of an energy and a dynamic. Now we're going to take a look at the beginning of the myth of Inanna from ancient Samaria in order to see just how in the transition from the subconscious Neolithic to the rather conscious Neolithic brought energy and dynamic together brought the male and female together, brought two different qualities that ran in the Paleolithic in conflicting ways and in the early Neolithic in even more difficult ways. But there was a time, the time was about 4,400 years ago, when for the very first time, a written record of a major step in consciousness was taken, and it was taken in Mesopotamia. It was taken in ancient Samaria. It was taken at the time of Sargon of Akkad. And I've showed you the uh, profile of Sargon, which in beaten metal has survived the 4,400 years. The great Semitic features of Sargon of Akkad whose daughter in Hedunana was the author of the myths of Inanna. It was Sargon's daughter who wrote the great Neolithic epic of Inanna. And so we'll, we're going to take a look at the beginnings of that epic just for the first page or two in order to understand how it is that an energy matrix gets integrated with a dynamic penetration and that this gives a transformation, bringing dynamic and energeia, dynamis and energeia together. And with that integration, transformation to a higher level was possible out of the integral cycle into the conscious cycle. And the birth of visionary consciousness at the time of Sargon and his daughter Enheduanna changed the face of the earth. For the first time, instead of having Sumerian city-states, you have a knitting together of all the city-states into a single pattern. And the single pattern is not just in the Tigris-Euphrates basin near the Persian Gulf. Before that, these cities were never more than about 100 miles from each other. But all of a sudden, with Sargon of Akkad, 
with the knitting together of city-states into something new, into a field, an energized, dynamic field, that field spread from the Persian Gulf all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, from the Persian Gulf all the way across Iran into the inner basin, where today would be Samarkand and Bokhara, all the way into central Anatolia, which today is Turkey, and all of a sudden, instead of having a collection of city-states that in a small crop dusting plain you could visit in half an hour, all of them, you have what was called and still is called and what was first called then the Fertile Crescent. The moon goddess's shape on earth, fertile. Not just the crescent because it arches from Persian Gulf to Mediterranean Sea, but Fertile Crescent because the masculine and feminine together brought energy and dynamic together and vivified in such a radical way that civilization on a conscious level was possible on a scale that had never been seen. It had never been seen. Now contemporaneous with the rise of that kind of energy, you have Contemporaneous with Sargon, you have the fifth dynasty in Egypt. The fourth dynasty in Egypt are the pyramid builders. And so the pyramid age in ancient Egypt is contemporaneous with the grandfather era of Sargon and the Fertile Crescent. At the same time that you have the pyramids in Egypt and the rising comprehension of Akkad in India, you have the great Indus civilization of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. And in China, you have the great first dynasty of China, the Xia dynasty, founded about 2215 BC, but getting its energy going about that time. And so in China, in India, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, all at the same time, you have this rising sense of a radical jump. We today call it a quantum jump, a quantum jump out of the cycle of integration that had always been enough for man to that step where visionary differentiation for the first time bursts upon man's capacity. And for the very first time, you have an iconography of human beings that includes a sun-like halo radiance around their head or over their head. The Saharastra chakra is ignited for the very first time. Instead of integration ending in the mind, it never ends in the glory of boundless consciousness. It's this kind of vision that we're dealing with now. We're dealing with the trigger. We're dealing with the beginnings of this, with, with the very way in which this happened. But in order to appreciate it, we're going to come to the beginning of the myth of Inanna. We have to take a look at the way in which forms in the mind are made and held. Now, before there are forms in the mind that are made and held, before thought forms are generated and made, there are feeling forms that are made in the heart. Feeling precedes thinking. The structures of thought are founded on the structures of feeling. The mind uses the heart as a template for its own generation. So before we can look at thought forms, we have to look at feeling forms. We have to look at the way in which feeling forms occur and happen. How do they hold together? How do they not hold together? Why is it that they work this way? We've talked about the way in which Nature, the very context of everything, cannot be characterized as things. Nature in no way is a box of things. 
To characterize nature, we use the phrase a matrix of change. We borrowed from the Chinese, from the I Ching. Nature is an ongoing, mysterious matrix of change. It's always a process. From any angle and any dimension, nature is happening, but never is. The isness occurs only with existence, and existence is an objectivization that's made out of an action, a pragmatos, a doing. And action, doing, registers as a body. In our case, our body. Our body is our existence. But our body has come out of nature, out of this tremendous process. Every atom of every material structure in our body came from where? They were made in stars. You cannot have carbon. You cannot have iron. You cannot have oxygen. None of these elements are made in nature simply. They're all made in forms of nature, like stars, which come together and step up the only elements that occur in a natural field before there are stars are hydrogen and helium and a trace of lithium. Very rarely lithium. To go above the stage of mutant lithium, you have to have stars that make the elements higher. And without that, nothing else can happen. And so the stars have made our bodies. So when we say, this body is my existence, the true mysterious nature behind and as a true context for this body is the whole cosmos. The atoms in this body remember the star birth that they had, each one of them. There's a detailed resonance that's there, which is why this body, when it becomes energized and dynamic to a mature conscious place, recognizes a kinship with the universe recognizes that the cosmos is home, is perilous because of circumstance, but is home because of structural relationality. The universe is a promise and a peril at the same time. Nature is a mystery. So that we saw that by taking nature first and then putting the nesting within the ark of nature, nesting the ark of ritual, so that existence rests in the cup of the mystery of nature. And now we're going to put a third cup inside of that, the cup of myth, the cup of language. The arc of language nestles into the arc of ritual, which nestles into the cup of nature. And when you begin to have three levels or more, we can use an engineering term for that. We can call that a laminate, a laminate. So that by the time language comes along, comes into play, by the time myth happens in the Neolithic, for the very first time, you get a, at that time, super technology. You get men and women who are very good at the technology of making laminate structures that never were there in nature before. And with these laminate materials, by adding language to what you do to nature, by taking the mystery of language and the mystery of nature and putting them together in like a resonant pair and having your action go in between. It's like the horns of the bull and the action goes in there as the moon. So that when one saw the old Paleolithic horns with the full moon in them, you knew that this was a signal that one had come out of the Paleolithic into the integral of the advanced Neolithic. And when you see the first sacred feminine, 
in the pyramid texts, you see the full moon in the midst of the horns as the symbol of the integral. And there it is, artistically, graphically, symbolically for the first time. And it signals and cues that men and women have already stepped up to that laminate form where language keys a material that now can be used to make any kind of effective tool, any kind of effective life, and language makes a new world. Mythic language, adding myth to ritual to nature, makes a whole new material, which is very pliable, very strong. The laminates sealed by language are strong enough to make a whole world. They refashion what was naturally there into what is now said to be there. And we have to watch ourselves here because we come from a very advanced form of civilization, several thousands of years after this. And we look back, and part of our jeopardy today, because we were never educated right, we were never given a good old Paleolithic introduction and a Neolithic transformation before we were given what happened afterwards, which indeed is very advanced and very far beyond. But if it isn't based on those old things first, you don't understand what it is you can do or what it is that you're doing. Like how thought forms are made on feeling forms first, and that the shapes of feeling are generated by laminates made of myth, bringing ritual and nature into a triadic suppleness. And once one gets appreciation for that, it becomes a matter then of just spending enough gritty time at it in order to get it combed out. No matter what the tangle is, you can comb it out. Ritual, we saw, objectifies existence and it registers in bodies. And that this objectivity maintains its emergence. It's constantly emerging. Even though it's there, it's constantly there because it's brought the mystery of nature into its very play. And when it brings nature into its play, existence constantly happening, constantly happens in a sequence. And that sequence, because of the substrate of nature, the sequences all arc. They never go in straight lines, they always curve. They always curve around. Natural forms are always curved. To have a line that does not curve takes a radical yogic purity of pure thought. In order to have a geometric line absolutely straight, one has to have a radically transcendent mind. Otherwise, it doesn't register. When you take a bubble chamber, like the one I saw at Berkeley, and you smash two atoms together, all the bits and pieces of the atoms, there are no straight lines, they curve. The only straight line occasionally that occurs is from a cosmic ray that is curving on such a subtle level that it doesn't register even in terms of dozens of light years. But nature has this kind of a quality. It curves, and so ritual action kinds of curves, and language itself has curves. A beautiful language is never a straight syllogistic statement, but always has a gracefulness to it. And the most developed conscious way of speaking is that of comprehensive circumlocution like James Joyce's Ulysses. If you were able to get to the far filigreed end of what you were saying, you would suddenly be talking about what you began to be talking about. River run past Howarth Castle and Buck Mulligan shaving again. 
It's this quality of myth that makes a mythology. The individual myths constellate around a mythic image, and the mythic image is a feeling form. It isn't that this image represents a thing in nature. There are no things in nature to represent. It's a mental error. It's a miseducation. It never happens. It's fictive to believe that it happens, and the belief that that's what happens is a delusion. And living on the basis of delusion, rather precarious. And the more you go with it, the more precarious it is, and because the cosmos doesn't recognize you as being part of it, it tends to flick you away. Like, let's take a break. You can see what happens. Let's take a break. In the Paleolithic, ritual actions wove together the laminates of nature, ritual, and myth. the ritual acts become dances so that in the Neolithic, one of the qualities that comes out is that one dances the ritual. Now there's always some wise guy who just before he gets up and leaves to steal the energy says, oh, so you think that the Paleolithic people didn't dance with well, the American Indian people danced and they didn't raise crops, they weren't farmers. But the fact is, is that those American Indian so-called Paleolithic warriors rode horses and they were tamed horses, which means they were Neolithic and not Paleolithic. And the women did ten gardens. Dancing your ritual is already a cue that the rhythms of time have entered into a mythic dimension rather than natural time, seasonal time, being the index to what is real, now danced rhythmic time is the index to what is real. If you dance it, it's going to be. So that I have heard it several times from old tribal members, but they never trusted the white man because he didn't dance. But they liked the 60s because people started dancing again. It didn't matter how wild, they're wild because they're not used to it. After four or 500 years, they'll get real, real close and they'll be people again. So that the Neolithic quality of ritual was always a rhythmic time that could be danced to, and myths were never told, they were chanted. A real myth teller chants the myth. And he has to have a cadence, which means that the old storytellers always had a cane, not because they were crippled, but because they weren't crippled, and they beat the cadence of the language in a cadenced language, in a danced time, signal the Neolithic and always bring a masculine-feminine laminate into play, which wasn't really there before. It wasn't there before. And these laminate parallels are glued by the objectivity sewing their paredness together. So nature and language get sewn together by ritual danced activity, which becomes fortified by mythic chanting or mythic singing, so that the wholeness or the health of the people is there because everything is sacredly so because it's been sung and danced. And if you take something that hasn't been worked into that laminate structure, it has to be sung over to make it holy. So if someone becomes sick, you have to bring them back into the parallel laminate forms of the real. 
they have somehow got crimped and thrown out into the unreal. That's why they're sick. Death is a part of life. It's not an issue. It's not a problem. But sickness is a problem. Disease is a problem. Lack of rain is a problem. It means that something's out of kilter. Something is out missing from the laminate flow. And so it has to be brought back in. And the only way it can be brought back in is through language being chanted, sung over it to make it holy. And the necessary ritual acts to sow that singing arc back into nature's arc. And when that happens, everything's going to flow again. We saw with Gladys Reichardt's presentation of the Navajo sand paintings. The sick person is put in the center of the sand painting, the center of the mandala. And what is sung is that this part of the body of the sick person is related to this part of the body of the sand painting. And slowly, over a four or eight or sometime nine day cycle, everything is sewn back together through a mythic language. And the patient, the illness is cured. No sulfides, no penicillin, singing sacred language by someone who knows how to sing it and dance it. Now, in the early Neolithic, the singer was very much shamanic in quality, but in the later Neolithic, the singer was always like a shepherd. So that when you see the good shepherd as the person who commands the holy language, then you know that this is very late Neolithic is the maturation. If you look at the earliest representations of the Good Shepherd in the catacombs, let's say, under Rome, the catacomb of Calixus, or several of those from like the late first century, early second century, the shepherd, the good shepherd, is always an Orphic figure. Orpheus, whose lute tames the wild animals, whose song tames the animals. It's a Paleolithic shaman who's been transformed into Neolithic shepherd and has the right language, the language now sings in a different way, uses the holy word in a different way, aiming towards a transformation that brings an interiorization. So that the Neolithic is a transformative era where men and women learned that their relationship to the natural world could be paired to a relationship to an inner world. But the inner world was quite different from the natural world, and so it was called supernatural. It's natural, but it's, it's more so, because it has the energia and the dynamic of language added to it. One of the peculiar qualities of being without language for a long time in nature is that you get startled to hear someone talk. If you've been out in nature with the plants and the animals and the stars for several weeks and never heard a, a voice and you've never talked yourself, the first time you say something, it's ghostly. It's very peculiar. It's a supernatural happening. Words are supernatural. And they strike like an energized lightning throughout the whole natural situation. One word 
reverberates everywhere, that there's a mysteriousness, that somehow in the house of the cosmos, the Lord of the manor has come home. As soon as there is a being who can speak and says the first word, which would be a name, that reverberation changes forever. The whole natural matrix. And what can happen from there is indexed now by language, no longer indexed by um, nature. So that language takes the lead. And in taking the lead, one must then become responsible. One must then take care. And so men and women who can talk, they take care of the plants and animals. It isn't that they team them so much, is that they shepherd them, they take care of them. And one of the peculiarities, one of the most striking mysteries for Neolithic men and women, especially for the Neolithic women who did most of the crop raising, who raised grain in the fields. In the Neolithic revolution, the cultivation, the taming and the taking care of are brought together in the word cultivation, cultivation. Culture is a population of people who cultivate the plants and the animals in themselves. It isn't a hoity-toity phrase that you become cultivated. It's that you enter into a caring, reciprocal, responsive relationship with the animals and the plants and each other. And in this resonant, vibrant field, the energy and the dynamic comes out in a new way. And one of the mysteries was always bread weight. Emer. And when you see a stalk of red wheat dried and find it around, you see all the thick kernels of red wheat layered together on the end of the stem. All the biological materia has gone into the kernels. That's why there's so many of them, they're so big. So all the materia has gone into the kernels, there's almost nothing left except little tiny spikes, hair-like spikes. In natural goat grass, the kind of wheat, quote wheat, that grows in nature, goat grass, has only four or five kernels. Most of the materia goes into these wings, these shells, these husks, that the wind then carries the seeds and it spreads itself. So natural occurring goat grass seeds itself by the wind. But there's a double mutation from goat grass to emer. And in the double mutation, bread wheat, emer, cannot seed itself naturally. The kernels are too heavy. They don't have any husks that can be like wings. They just fall again and again in the same place and uh, maybe only one stalk or two or three stalks will ever grow because they just fall on top of each other. The only way that bread wheat happens and continues to thrive is that the hand of man sows it. Without the hand of man to sow it, bread wheat wouldn't exist. So it isn't just like mutating natural wheat it's like understanding that the whole relationality involves care together. That's tying the bow. And when you understand that, and you understand that you must sing this to be real. The wheat of Asia, rice, has to be planted by hand every damn day crop. Not just every year, but in some places, you can get two, even three crops of rice. But each time, and there are always ritual songs that go with the planting of the rice. 
If you see Kurosawa's Seven Samurai about Paleolithic warriors right at the very end, the winners are the peasants who are singing the rice planting songs again. They get to do that. The courageous glory of the Paleolithic warriors, which saved life, made it all possible, are now extraneous to the more inclusive, encompassing reality, the rice planting songs and the life of Neolithic people going on. They have no more use for the Paleolithic shame. What does Shane tell the little boy? Tell your mother there are, are no more guns in the valley. And he rides out because he knows. He's a Paleolithic warrior. He isn't, he's not a farmer. He doesn't belong there. He doesn't belong not only in the valley, he doesn't belong in that whole era. That 12,000 year era is not his place. He belongs in the old times. Because in the Neolithic, the masculine Courage needs to tether itself to a center. The masculine courage is because he's willing and able to prowl the peripheries, the boundaries, the liminalities all the time with restless relentlessness, but always tethered to the center, related to the center, always in terms of protecting the home, protecting the turf. The most vicious gangs protect their turf. They're Neolithic, they're not Paleolithic. You put a Paleolithic warrior into a gang warfare, it's game is over. One Terminator takes care of a whole city of gangs. Paleolithic warrior, totally different scale, professional violence. <laughs> It's like in the Odyssey, there are 105 suitors, but they're Neolithic men, where Odysseus has regressed. He's gone back to the old Paleolithic, and one Paleolithic warrior kills all the suitors. He locks the doors so they can't get out. I want you all here. And Homer says that each time Odysseus shot an arrow, the thrum of the bowstring made a deep bass vibration, and that after a while in the rhythm of that death song, Odysseus was the only poet in the place. He was playing their death song with his bow. Un unbeatable, unstoppable. One Toshiro Mifune and 500 Neolithic boys. This is no contest at all. Because the scale of reality has its positioning, has its place. Dirty Harry goes back to the Paleolithic, which is why the punks make his day. His day is that he's brought, you want violence, we'll bring it down to where it really can get there. Professional killing. But we live in a time where the Neolithic is transformed already and is trans what that transformed into is transforming again. Into something so new it doesn't even have a name yet, but its name will have nothing to do with lithic, either paleo or neo, or transcendent neo, uh, transcendent lithic. Whatever it is, it'll have the term instead of lithic for stone, it'll have the term for space. Whatever men and women are going to be able to have life in, its reality will have something to do with space and not with stones at all. The Neolithic will be a regression. And there may be times when we have to regress. We have to learn how to sing something holy again. So we need an education that remembers everything way back because there may come a time when we even have to resuscitate a Paleolithic quality. There are those events. But the new never comes out of the old until the old is complete. 
because differentiation never does its quantum jump until the integral cycle is complete and whole. And until you have a horizon completely saturated, you don't have the precipitation of something new. And so you have to saturate the energy field with the dynamic implosion to a point of transformation. Transformations never happen with lazy camaraderie. There's no lazy man's guide to transformation. It happens because reality cannot stop you any further. <laughs> and reality has a dogged way of having resistances cling to the osmotic layer so that the very last step is always the mostest. And just before you step free is the point of maximum tension. And the maximum tension always registers with the word can't be done. No. You're doomed. And so the voice always says you're doomed. And somebody really wise, when they hear that voice, they smile because they know that's it. The next step is home free. <laughs> Tell me again, demons, I'm done for? Thank you. And those demons who forbade you must now protect you. <laughs> they get the thankless task of watching after you. You who have just shown how paltry they are in face of someone masterful in reality, they serve you. Now we come to Inanna, because Inanna, when she breaks through all the resistances, the demons come and serve her. One of the most fierce of a pair of demons is the Anzu bird in ancient Sumeria. The Anzu bird was like a, um, a thunderbird, had really huge claws and fantastically powerful wings and a beak, a monstrous eagle-like creature occurs in the Arabian Nights uh, tales in the seven cycle of Sinbad the sailor occurs as the rock. The bird so large it can pick a man up whose eggs are just enormous, who nests in volcanoes like the phoenix, the bird of time, the bird of fiery cycles of transformation. Here's Inanna, and the way that the mythology of Nana begins, it begins with creation, and in Diane Volkstein's beautiful translation of Inhe Duana's 4,400-year-old rhythmic cycle, in the first days, in the very first days, in the first nights, in the very first nights, in the first years, in the very first years, in the first days when everything needed was brought into being, in the first days when everything needed was properly nourished, when bread was baked in the shrines of the land and bread was tasted in the homes of the land. And you get this introduction for the first time of what will become an energized matrix of four pairs. You can read it a thousand times and never get it. You have to have a, a differential vision in order to see the matrix quality of this. So to save time, just lay it out for you. Let me read it to you as prose and see if you can pick up the matrix of four pairs. 
In the first days when everything needed was brought into being, in the first days when everything needed was properly nourished, when bread was baked in the shrines of the land and bread was tasted in the homes of the land, when heaven had moved away from earth and earth had separated from heaven and the name of man was fixed, when the sky god An had carried off the heavens and the air god Enlil had carried off the earth, when the queen of the great below, Ereshkigal, was given the underworld for her domain. When you have the first pair, it doesn't jive right away. The first pair is being and bread. Being and bread. The second pair, of course, heaven and earth. The third pair, the two gods, the sky god and the earth god, An and Enlil. And the fourth pair is name of man and Erishkagal of the queen of the great below. The name of man and Arishkigal, which is the name of the queen of the great below, form a pair. Whatever your name is, the name of you as a human pairs itself with Arishkigal. But notice here that being pairs itself with bread. It's very difficult to understand the intricacy of the forms because we don't feel them clearly anymore. And because we can't feel them clearly, we can't think of them. So to think of them so that we can understand it, so that we can have a vision and go, go, go where it's beyond is, before any of that can happen, we have to learn to feel again. We have to have intelligibility of feeling. And feeling intelligibility is all based on the way in which images are able to form themselves. Later on, ideas form themselves in thought, but ideas can be vanished from thought if you have a weak feeling intelligence. If you panic, you lose the clarity of thought right away. First casualty is a good idea. It was a good idea till you got scared and then it was no idea at all. What's the saying? You have no idea what's coming. But images, their feeling form is there because of a weaving together. Those forms are always woven. Images are always woven. Images do not stand for mechanically something, something which is in nature. That whole referential understanding is a beggar's logic. It has nothing to do with intelligence. Any first grade yogi would just throw it away. And graduate yogis just chuckle about this. You really think that that's how it is? The whole foundation of Sophisticated Indian logic is on feeling fields. When you get into Nayaya Nayaya logic of the Gupta era, era, you have to have feeling tones. That's why Shiva is so important and Shakti. Not because they're superstitious people, they're not superstitious at all. They're practical. They want to do it and they get it done. You cannot have a yogic clear logic of form until you have a feeling field that's saturated with intelligence. When the heart is really an intelligent field, it can weave not only two, three, four, five images at a time, but it can rain images by the thousands or the millions. An image, when it comes into play, comes out of perception. It's woven from perception, just like an idea is woven from conception. The feeling impregnates the very process of weaving images. And later on, stronger feelings like emotions, they are saturated all the way through in which, the way in which conceptions happen and are woven into ideas. 
So if you have someone who has a complete vulnerability and susceptibility to strong emotion, their conceptions are always going to skew off in a way which is very predictable. It, there's actually a geometry to it. And you can work it out ahead of time. It could be programmed on a computer. But the basis of the skewing of the conception is all on a template of the way in which perception becomes skewed. Now, in nature, perception is never skewed. Perception en naturel is indelibly accurate, impeccably precise, but gets skewed in the interiorization of the weaving process so that the images are what can go astray. So images can be misimages. They can be crippled images vis-a-vis -vis what the real image would be. They can be impaired. One of the responsibilities of a mythology is to keep the image base healthy. <laughs> That's why there are, is a mythology, to keep that image base healthy so that perception in nature can function with the language forms that the laminate structures of society then on Neolithic level can work, can be healthy. They never can work. There's no healing process that is effective unless the image base is functioning. And a mythology does that. And this becomes rather precarious because in the Paleolithic, what was called in the Neolithic gods, in the Paleolithic were not gods at all, but were spirits. Spirit in the Neolithic is called Theos in the Greek, God. But Theos, God, in the Paleolithic is called Daimon, Daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N, pronounced Daimon, Daimon. So the demons are the gods of the Paleolithic. Now you find a very interesting thing. In India, the word for God is diva. <laughs> Familiar to us from New York City opera, opera divas. They're the goddesses of, of the opera, Maria Callas, etc. But in Iran, the divas are the demons. They're the bad guys. Because India is a Neolithic civilization where on its foundation, in terms of its mythology, India is Neolithic, but Iran is Paleolithic. It goes back to much more ancient times, much on scale of tens of thousands of years. The gods of India are spirits in Iran. They occur to someone outside as uh, demons. One of the most difficult confusions to weather is the Roman misconception of the ancient Near East, which is founded on an old Iranian Paleolithic, modified by an Egyptian Neolithic and translated into um, Greek language. And the Romans came along, swallowed the whole thing by taking it over and never understood the laminate structure of it at all. And so Roman religion, when it became a state religion like that set up by Constantine, populated the underworld with demons. 
Then the world is seething with demons and one has to keep away from it, was the seeds and the roots of what became the unconscious of Western man. What's underneath Western man? Underneath the veneer of civilization? Underneath that very thin level of culture and cultivation? A subconscious populated by demons. An unconscious that's hellish. All of this is a massive fiction and an unnecessary extrapolation that has no bearing on anything whatsoever. And it certainly has no place in the third millennium. It has no place in a population of men and women who are at home in the cosmos. The best place if there were subconscious, unconscious demons to lurk is the spaces in between the stars, right? Interstellar space. And interstellar space is filled with good vibrations <laughs> and with organic molecules, no less. I don't want to get into it, but uh, even the soot in meteorites contains uh, organic uh, molecules. Contemporary astronomy has a list, a half page long now, of organic molecules that are in interstellar gas clouds. Life is everywhere. The cosmos is alive. There are no demons there as in bad demons, but there are spirits there as in spirits of life. But one has to understand that the transformation from spirits to gods is a transformation in the way in which time is experienced, increasingly as rhythmic, in which cycles become quaternary instead of tertiary, in the way in which mythologies keep healthy an image base, and when the image base is healthy, feeling becomes very intelligent. You don't have to have any ability to think whatsoever to be really intelligent about life. There are many people who are startlingly intelligent about life. They don't know how to think at all. But they could learn to think. Because when your feelings are intelligent, you get thought very quickly. Just a matter then of, of education. And you can bring someone who's heartful into understanding very easily. They get it very, very, very quickly because they have all the template patterns that are operative. The inner feeling, the inner feeling focuses perception into images. And when that inner feeling deepens and becomes thought, then conception focuses into ideas. Now to focus an idea takes an awful lot. It takes a lot of dynamic and a concomitant energy level, which is very high. It's high enough to be another order above that of feeling. Thought is an order above feeling. Just as feeling is a whole order above just action, just pure, simple action. when we get to it later on to the way in which transcendental vision happens and consciousness um, in its differential indexing advances even beyond thought one can then go back to pure action without any feeling without any thought and it will still have intelligibility it'll have the intelligibility of visionary consciousness but that's a whole three sections away, nine months away. For now, it's enough to try to be able to appreciate that the power of feeling gives form to experience on the base of images. The power of feeling gives form to experience on the base of images. So that myth is all about an image base 
which somehow constellates experience into forms that exemplify feeling and feeling tones, no less, so that you could tune feeling by playing a sequence of perceptual notes. Orpheus plays his lute, and when he plays the chord on the lute, all of the notes sounded together, that chord, harmony occurs in a feeling-toned intelligence. Harmony. Because any pitched sequence is capable of a harmonic. And if the notes of a sequence are brought together in terms of a scale, struck in unison together, that chord elicits a harmonic. Not just in someone who can feel that, but in any other instrument that could play that. If you sound a chord on a lyre, every other lyre in the temple is going to vibrate to that chord. The strings will vibrate. If you have a room full of violins and you play B flat on an A violin, all the other violins will resonate B flat. And the cosmos is that way, the entire cosmos. We're not just talking about star system, which is already fantastic. We're talking about galaxies without end resonates to certain chord, high consciousness. Mm. Everything is ready to sing. It's on this level of mysteriousness that human beings constantly, from the very beginning, were sensitive because nature already is the resonance of a cosmos that's in tune by harmonic. Already. It doesn't just blankly start there with nature. Nature is already the resonance of a cosmos before it, world without end. Now for us, just as perception forms images and holds them by feeling tones, if your feeling tones are not healthful if they don't have the balance of energy and dynamic. Health is a balance of energia and dynamics. If the energy and the dynamic are balanced, then that particular image can sustain itself as long as you wish, as long as you sustain it. To the extent that either the energy or the dynamic is crimped, that image is not sustainable and undergoes a kind of a permutation like blurring or becomes wobbly or skews itself into some, something else. Instead of the rose staying uh, white, it tends to become grayish or something like that so that the imagery is right away a cue to the ability to have perception achieve form through feeling. And you can tune yourself, you can train yourself very easily because you can use either a simple stringed instrument or a flute. The natural flute tones also bring the sound. So that, for instance, in ancient China, where the translation was to a very advanced Neolithic, the Confucian odes were always sung to a lute. You would never have read Confucius silently to yourself. They always were chanted in accompaniment to a lute so that the Lun Yu, the Analects of Confucius, was delivered in the right ritual way because then the mythology would take place in making its laminate structure and all of nature would follow, all of ritual would follow the language and go where you directed it. And out of that would come, did come, 
stays Chinese civilization. It's absolutely the case, and one can check it out because you can go back through this once you have this, and you can read it for yourself. You can read it how it works for yourself because it registers all the way through. None of it's guesswork. It's mysterious not because you're guessing, it's mysterious because everything is exact. It is so exact, that's why it's mysterious. It's mysterious out of exactness. Now as the power of feeling gives form to experience on the base of images, the power of thinking gives form to essence or symbols on the matrix of ideas. And our whole next section after myth is on symbol. But we have to let the 12-part sequence of myth get its curvature, get its maturation, because if we go into symbols before it gets its maturation, then the whole symbolic sequence, which is going to align itself with the myth, it's going to be connected to the myth. If the myth is not curved, then the symbols are not going to curve. That whole alignment will be straight. And if you get straight line of myth and symbol, the regression is a direct line back to ritual. This is how you get membership in the National Socialist Party, the Nazis. Because there's no conscious blossoming out of straight line myth symbol tandems. They become like arrows of death dealing rather than arcs of life harvesting. And so a good education, a really comprehensive education, an integral and differential education gives its people the material that's needed to live life in its fullness. That's the only reason why there's an education. Life is so full, and the education shows how to hunt and gather, how to cultivate and tame, how to transform and enjoy. And that's its function. We'll come back to myth three next week. Try to read the first section of Inanna, the Hulupu tree, and be aware that there's a four pair matrix which energizes it, the bread and being, the heaven and earth, the An and Enlil, the name of man and Arishkigal. But the dynamic that comes into penetration of that energy condensing matrix is Enki, the god of wisdom. He's the arrow shot into the heart, which ignites love. It's there at the very beginning. We're looking ahead. The next pair of books is going to be Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I prefer the Tolkien, the J.R.R. Tolkien translation. And a book by Ruth Benedict called Patterns of Culture. Ruth Benedict takes three different styles of human beings. The suspicious dobu of the uh, Indonesian uh, archipelagos the Zuni Indians, the Kwakiutl, and shows in three different populations of men and women from the transition to Paleolith from Paleolithic to Neolithic that they're human in completely different ways. Their values are completely different. To make an integration between those three human cultures would require stepping all three up to a transformation to a higher order. Once upon a time, there was a problem of individual city-states that needed to be transformed to a higher order. It was achieved 4,400 years ago. And out of that came the Fertile Crescent, which became the driving engine of history. Almost everything that we record his history came out of that driving engine, that energy and that dynamic. The energy and dynamic of the entire future, not just of this planet and this star system, but this whole area of space depends on our making the right transformation. 
So there are a lot of beings in the cheering section. We'll see you next week.